Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see everybody coming in. We'll take a few minutes to admit the folks in the waiting room as people join us. If you want to put something in the chat about where you're coming from, that would be great. I, uh, it's a beautiful day here in Maine. We haven't had too many of them, but I know people are come here from, join us from all over the U.S. and often all over the world. So Oh, we have a group of students from Ohio Dominican. That's wonderful. Welcome. Yes, I, I got an email from uh, someone saying that a, a, a student club wanted to host this reading and all listen all together. So I think it was the Gay Straight Student Alliance Club. So that's wonderful. I'll give it another minute or so um, for people to come in. It looks like we have most of the waiting room admitted. I'm sure there will be more joining us, but I'll get started because we have a very full and exciting program today. So I want to welcome all of you. I'm Meg Weston from the Poets' Corner. If you're new to the Poets' Corner, it was founded in June of 2020. And if you all remember what you were doing in June of 2020, it was probably like what I was doing. We were sheltered in our homes. And I said to a friend of mine, I need some community around writing. And so how about we start a monthly reading series? So we did, and Catherine Seitz was co-founder. She's no longer involved because of health reasons, but we wanted a community of writers and readers of poetry and short prose. And today we have over 4,500 members from all around the world. And it's very exciting, all the different ways. We host a monthly reading on Zoom. And then we've also started doing some other things like craft talks and um, a chapbook contest and things. So I'd like to, before we get going on today's program, just tell you a little bit about upcoming events on the Poets' Corner in May, in collaboration with the Camden Festival of Poetry, we will be hosting an online craft talk with Padre Gotuma. And Padre is an Irish poet and peace activist, probably known to all of you. The host of a very popular podcast called Poetry Unbound. Um, his craft talk is called You, 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 The Address of Poetry. You can sign up and register. There is a fee for the craft talk, but you can register on our website, thepoetscorner.org. And if you happen to be in Midcoast, Maine, or want to come to Midcoast Day, Maine, in the middle of May, May 17th and 18th is the Camden Festival of Poetry. And Padre will be our keynote this year. On Wednesday, May 29th, which is a different day of the week for us, but Wednesday evening from 7 to 9, 7 to 8.30 Eastern Time, we are hosting Tess Taylor and five poets from her beautiful anthology called Leaning Toward Light, Poems for Gardens and the Hands that Tend Them. And uh, it's a beautiful book, fabulous poets reading, and you can sign up for that on the website. On June 9th, we'll be hosting the not yet announced winner of our 2024 chapbook con competition. It was judged by the poet Marie Howe, and she will be hosting 
a reading on Zoom on the Poets' Corner on June 9th. And the announcement of the winner will be made at the festival this year. So let's get on to today's program because that's what you all came for. And this is the second month that we posted Chris Nelson of Green Linden Press. And I'm so thrilled to do that again. He's the founder and owner of the press. He's a poet himself and the editor of this amazing anthology, Essential Queer Voices of U.S. Poetry, 100 Poets for Our Present and Future. And we'll put a link in the chat. Um, if you haven't bought the book, I think you absolutely must. Uh, you know, so many of my favorite poets are already in this book, and I'm also discovering new, new voices. But uh, five of them are here with us today. Rick Barrett, Ellen Bass, and Richard Blanco, all three of whom I've taken workshops with and learned so much from. And then Leanne Rarpa and Sharif Shanahan. And I look forward to hearing their voices. Um, there's something magical about hearing the voice of the poet, not just on the page, but in our ears and in our bodies. And that's what I so enjoy about hosting the Poets' Corner. So I'll leave it up to Chris to introduce our poets, but I'd like to just say a few words about him. I first met him last spring when Mark Burroughs read from his translation of Hilda Domain's poetry published by Green Linden Press. And last month, Chris joined us again for a translation of Sergei Gondolevsky's work a Russian poet, translated and read by Philip Metris. It was a wonderful reading. If you missed it, the recording is up on the website under past events. Chris is a poet himself and the author of Blood Aria, as well as four chapbooks, including Blue House, which was the winner of a Poetry Society of America Fellowship. He's the founding editor of Green Linden Press, a nonprofit publisher dedicated to poetic excellence and reforestation. Chris makes it his mission to bring us voices that need to be heard, whether in translation or in English. So it's really my pleasure to welcome Chris back again to the Poets' Corner. Please join me in welcoming Chris Nelson. Thank you, Meg, for that kind introduction and for hosting us again at the Poets' Corner, and for all you do to enrich the the poetry community. I think we're we're all indebted to you. Uh, thanks to the audience for being here and to our wonderful poets for sharing their work and their time. Um, as Meg mentioned, she said some things about Greenland and Press. I'll add to that just a bit. We are based in Grinnell, Iowa, and. Um, we are a nonprofit. We are dedicated to poetic excellence and reforestation. We've planted 750 trees to date. So a portion of all of the sales go towards a reforestation fund. Um, we also publish a biannual digital journal called Under a Warm Green Linden. We have a broadside series, a chat book series, and two annual book series. Um, one, the Wishing Jewel Prize for Poetic Innovation, and the Stephen Mitchell Prize for Excellence in Translation. Essential Queer Voices of U.S. Poetry, 100 Poets for the Present and Future, is the second anthology in the Essential Voices series, which aims to make less insular the various poetries of the world and to address misrepresentation and misunderstandings in the broader culture. At its heart is the ancient idea that poetry can reveal our shared humanity. The first in the series, Poetry of Iran and its Diaspora, received a Midwest Book Award and was named by Entropy Magazine as one of the best books of poetry in 2021. Of course, both anthologies are available uh, at Greenland and Press, and we'll make sure the link is in the chat. This anthology, Essential Queer Voices, grew out of two necessities. The first, to be a sort of rebuttal 
sometimes joyful, sometimes a raised fist, to the over 500 recent legislative attempts to curtail the freedoms of queer people. Um, and some of those attempts, of course, have been successful with life endangering consequences, like the denial of health care for transgender people. And the second necessity grew out of my conviction that as an editor of 20 years, much of the best poetry today is being written queer people. So simply, I wanted to gather from that bounty and celebrate it. So thank you for being here and being part of that celebration. Rick Barrett was born in the Philippines and grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. He has published four books of poetry, including The Galleons, which was listed on the top 10 poetry books for 2020 by the New York Public Library, he was a finalist for the Pacific Northwest Book Awards, and was on the long list for the National Book Award. Among his many honors are fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Shelley Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America. He lives in Tacoma, Washington, and teaches at Pacific Lutheran University, where he directs the Rainier Writing Workshop. A new book, Moving the Bones, will be published in October, certainly not to be missed. Please welcome Rick Barrett. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks to Meg Weston at the Poets' Corner as well for um, hosting us. It's really wonderful to be here. And I want to uh, say just how grateful I am to Chris for editing the anthology and producing the anthology. As any of you who has done something like this knows, it, it's an enormous amount of uh, labor and love to put together an anthology like this one. I'm going to read two poems, my two poems in the anthology. And uh, the first poem is titled On Gardens. And as Chris mentioned, I was born in the Philippines. So the poem is about the, the nearly 300 years that the Philippines was a colony of Spain. And um, just a quick heads up that uh, sexual violence and profanity appear in this poem. On Gardens. When I read about the garden designed to bloom only white flowers, I think about the Spanish friar who saw one of my grandmothers 200 years removed and fucked her. If you look at the word colony far enough, you see it traveling back to the Latin of inhabit, till, and cultivate. Words that would have meant something to the friar walking among the village girls as though in a field of flowers, knowing that fucking was one way of having a foreign policy. As I write this, there's snow falling, which means that every angry thought is as short-lived as a match. The night is its own white garden, snow on the fence, snow on the tree stump, snow on the azalea bushes, their leaves hanging down like green bats from the branches. I know it's not fair to see qualities of injustice in the aesthetics of a garden, but somewhere between what the eye sees and what the mind thinks, there is the world. Landscapes mangled into sentences, one color red into heat. When the neighbors complain, the roots of our cypress were buckling their lot. My landlord cut the tree down. I didn't know a living thing three stories high could be so silent until it was gone. Suddenly, all that sky, suddenly all the light in the windows, as though every sheet of glass was having a migraine. When I think about that grandmother whose name I don't even know, I think of what it would mean to make a garden that blooms only black, peonies and gladiolas of deepest purple, tulips like ravens, or a garden that doesn't bloom at all, rocks oriented on a plain of raked gravel, the stray leaves cleared away every hour by monks. If you look at the word garden deep enough, you see it blossoming in an enclosure meant to keep out history and disorder like the neighbors wanting to keep the cypress out, like the monks arranging the stones 
into an image of serenity. When the snow stops, I walk to see the quiet that has colonized everything. The main street is asleep, except for the bus that goes by, bright as a cruise ship. There are sheet cakes of snow on top of cars. In front of houses, each lawn is as clean as paper, except where the first cat or raccoon has walked across. Each track like a barbed wire sash on a white gown. I forgot to mention that the spark point for that poem was reading about the garden of Vida Sackville West at her famous garden called Knoll. And many of you will recognize Vida Sackville West as, as uh, having been the, the lover of Virginia Woolf. Uh, during her time, she was quite a famous writer herself, but she's now uh, really famous for that garden, uh, a part of which was created to have plants that only have white flowers. And the idea of having a garden that only had white flowers somehow triggered for me that poem. So this next poem is titled Whitman 1841. And if you're interested in learning more about the event that's described in this poem, I urge you to read the, the really terrific David Reynolds biography of Walt Whitman. Whitman, 1841. I don't know if he did or did not touch the boy, but the boy told a brother or a father or a friend who told someone in tavern or told someone about it while the men hauled in the nets of fish from the sound. Or maybe it was told to someone on the street, a group of men talking outside the village schoolhouse where he was the teacher. And what was said brought everyone to church that Sunday where the preacher said his name from the pulpit and the pews cleared out to find him. He was 21 and thought of himself as an exile. He was boarding with the boy and his family the boy was a boy in that schoolroom he hated. Not finding him in the first house, they found him in another and dragged him from under the bed where he had been hiding. He was led outside and they took the, fa the, and they took the tar they used for their boats and they broke some pillows for their feathers. And the biography talks about those winter months when there was not a trace of him until the trail of letters, articles, stories, and poems started up again and showed that he was back in the big city. He was done with teaching. That was one part of himself completed, though the self would never be final, the way his one book of poems would never stop taking everything into itself the look of the streets and the buildings, the look of men and women, the names of ferry boats and trains, the name of the village, which was Southhold, the name of the preacher, which was Smith. Thank you very much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you, Rick. Ellen Bass's most recent collection is Indigo. Her other poetry books include Like a Beggar, The Human Line, and Mules of Love. Among her awards are fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the California Arts Council, the Lambda Literary Award, and four Pushcart Prizes. She co-edited the anthology, No More Masks, and her nonfiction books include the groundbreaking Courage to Heal, a guide for women survivors of child sexual abuse, and Free Your Mind, the book for gay, lesbian, and bisexual youth. A chancellor emerita of the Academy of American Poets, Bass founded poetry workshops at Salinas Valley State Prison and the Santa Cruz, California jails and teaches at the MFA writing program at Pacific University. Please welcome Ellen Bass.
Thank you. And thank you so much for this anthology, which is so rich and so necessary. And I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, delighted and honored to be reading here with all these poets who I admire so much. And thanks everybody for coming to listen. I'm going to read um, two poems from the anthology and then uh, see how the time is, maybe read another a little bit more. This is Mammogram Callback with Ultrasound. So this is what I'm here for, to see inside the mute weight of my right breast, heavy handful of treasure I longed for as a girl, crying behind the curtain in the Gurlane sisters' corset shop. Those tender spinsters could hardly bear my tears as they adjusted the straps on a padded lace bra. I had to wait another year before my breasts swelled like wind-filled sails, and many were the explorers carried away, searching for perfumes and spices, the nerve-laden nipples singing through the wires. But never has there been a joy like this, as I lie in the pale green cool of radiology, the lineage of death has swerved around me. More happy love, more happy, happy love. As the wand of the ultrasound glides over my flesh, revealed is a river of light, a bright undulant tangle of lobules and milk ducts, harmless and radiant against the black fat. I could be looking up at the night sky, this wispy band of brilliance a shining spur of the Milky Way galaxy. And I, in my infinitesimal life, will, at least for tonight, keep these lovely atoms before I must return them to the stars. And this next poem is called Ode to Fat. I've written a lot of odes and one of the one of my favorite kind of odes is, is writing to praise things that are not normally praised or even uh, are despised. So this is Ode to Fat. Tonight, as you undress, I watch your wondrous flesh that swelled again the way a river swells when the ice relents. Sweet relief, just to regard the sheaves of your hips your boundless breasts and marshy belly. I adore the acreage of your thighs and praise the promising planets of your ass. Oh, you were lean, that terrifying year you were unraveling. As though you were returning to the slender scrap of a girl I fell in love with. But your skin was vacant, a ripped sack, sugar spilling out and your bones insistent. Oh, praise the loyalty of the body that labors to rebuild its palatial realm. Bless butter, bless brie, sanctify schmaltz and cream and cashews. Stoke the furnace of the stomach and load the vessels. Darling, drench yourself in opulent oil, the lamp of your body glowing. May you always flourish enormous and sumptuous, be marbled with flat fat, a great vault that I can enter, the cathedral where I pray. This next poem is um, from a, a previous book. It's called The Morning After. You stand at the counter pouring boiling water over the French roast, oily perfume rising in smoke. And when I enter, you don't look up. You're hurrying to pa pack your lunch, snapping the lids on little plastic boxes while you call your mother to tell her you'll take her to the doctor. I can't see a trace of the little slice of heaven we slipped into last night. A silk kimono, floating satin ponds and copper koi, stars falling to the water. Didn't we shoulder our way through the cleft in the rock of the everyday and tear up the grass in the pasture of pleasure? 
if the soul isn't a separate vessel we carry from form to form, but more like Aristotle's breath of life, the work of the body that keeps it whole. Then last night, darling, our souls were busy, but this morning it's like you're wearing a bad wig, disguised so I won't recognize you, or maybe so you won't know yourself as that animal burned down to pure desire. I don't know how you do it. I want to throw myself onto the kitchen tile and bare my throat. I want to slick back my hair and tap dance up the wall. I want to do it all, all over again. Dive back into that brawl, that raw and radiant free-for-all. But you are scribbling a shopping list because the kids are coming for the weekend and you're going to make your special crab cakes that have ruined me for all other crab cakes forever. And I'll, I'll read one more poem. Um, one, of the, one of the things, I, uh, my wife and I have been together for uh, about, well, I think it's about 42 years. And um, for the first 10 or 15 years, um, when she annoyed me, I was just annoyed. But then I had an, a, a Satori experience when all of a sudden, I realize that the things that are annoying are incredible fodder for poetry. And after that, um, it's not that I don't get annoyed, but my first reaction now is always, hmm, what can I do with this? Is there something I can make of this? And um, so she she is in a very uh, strange way uh, often my muse. And this is another one in which she is. <clears throat> taking off the front of the house. I'm at the kitchen table, drinking strong tea, eating eggs with poppy gold yolks from our chickens, Marilyn and Estelle. There's a red car parked across the street and my neighbor's gorgeous irises, their frilled tongues tasting the air. Monsanto is suing Vermont, I say, turning the pages of the Times. I say it loud because Janet's in the living room in the faded chair the cat has scratched into hay, eating yogurt and the strawberries she brought home from the field where she labors to relieve the tender berry of its heavy chemical load. What, she says, she isn't wearing her hearing aids. So I take a breath and project my voice. And as I enunciate the corporate evils, suddenly the front of the house is sheared away. We're on a stage, the audience seated on the asphalt of Young Love Avenue, watching this quirky couple eat their breakfast and yell back and forth from one room to another. And throughout the day, as I throw a load of laundry in the dryer, answer the phone, as she lies on the couch reading Great Expectations, and we bicker about the knocking in the pipes and whether we really need to call a plumber, I admire how the actor who plays the character of me and the actor who plays the character of her perform our parts so perfectly in this production that will last just a little while before it closes for good. And when night comes, we smoke a little weed, something called thunderfuck, which must be someone's high opinion of himself, but in truth is quite nice, though we only take a couple tokes since Janet's on blood pressure medication and she can't do the way she did at 20 when she slung a goatskin bag over her shoulder and wandered around Senegal in flip-flops. As I reach for her, she says, now the audience can sit on the back deck by the barbecue and this play can be called The Old Lesbians Go to Bed at the End of the Day. I light the candle her mother gave me for my last birthday when she could still put on her lipstick. The set is authentic, a messy stack of books on my nightstand. On her side, the hearing aids that sit there all day. And as she turns toward me, and I feel again the marvelous architecture of her hips, the moon, that expert in lighting, rises over the roof line, flooding us in her flawless silvery wash. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. That was wonderful.
Richard Blanco was selected by President Obama as the fifth inaugural poet in U.S. history. Born in Madrid to Cuban exile parents and raised in Miami, cultural identity characterizes his many collections of poetry and prose. Blanco is an associate professor of creative writing at Florida International University and a recent recipient of the National Endowment for the Humanities Medal. His new book is Homeland of My Body. Please welcome Richard Blanco. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for putting this together. And Meg, um, I'll just echo how wonderful and important this anthology is and and uh, sharing uh, the stage with with my fellow poets, all of which I have a personal connect connection with. So it's wonderful to be here with you today. I'll start with a poem from the anthology. Um, and briefly, I guess this is about the one that got away, so to speak, or that I let get away. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And uh, yeah, it's all sort of a love poem uh, mixed in with landscape. Maybe for Craig. Maybe it was the billboards promising paradise. Maybe those 59 miles with your hand in mine. Maybe my sexy roaster, the top down. Maybe the wind fingering your hair, sun on your thighs, and bare chest. Maybe it was just the ride over the sea split in two by the highway to Key Largo, or the idea of Key Largo. Maybe I was finally in the right place at the right time with the right person. Maybe there'd finally be a house, a dog named Chu, a lawn to mow, neighbors, dinner parties, and you forever obsessed with Croxford puzzles and Carl Jung, reading in the dark by the moonlight at my bedside every night, maybe. Maybe it was the clouds paused at the horizon, the blinding fields of golden sawgrass, the mangrove islands tangled, inseparable as we might be. Maybe I should have said something, promised you something, asked you to stay a while longer. Maybe. And so in the spirit of Ellen's poem, uh, <laughs> in the ways that, um, uh, the annoyances in our relationship become fodder. Um, I, I think I learned that trick much later than you, but <laughs> I'm, I'm learning it. Um, and so, my one of my pet peeves with uh, with my husband of 25 years is that he never calls. Um, you know, hey, I'm going to the gym, and four hours later, I have no idea. So, um, where he is, and uh, I inherited my mother's paranoia genes, and so I'm already expecting the worst, and um, you know, I'm ready, you know, ready to to get the bad news. Um, so. Uh, What's interesting to me about this poem, too, is that when I first wrote it um, and read it in our little town in Bethel, Maine, I thought it was a gay poem because it's about a gay relationship, right? And, and you know, the lumberjack's like, we love that poem, Killing Mark, you know, and I can realize that you don't have to be gay to have a dysfunctional relationship. <laughs> so I realize the universality of love is love, right? The, you know, the relationships are so similar in some ways, regardless. So it's called Killing Mark, uh, even though it is a love poem. Killing Mark. His plane went down over Los Angeles last week. Again. Or was it Long Island? Boxer shorts, hair gel, his toothbrush washed up on the shore at New Haven, but his body never recovered, I feared. Monday, he cut off, he cut off his leg chainsawing, bled to death slowly while, shop, while I was shopping for a new lamp. Never heard my messages on his cell phone. Where are you? Call me. I told him to be careful. He never listens. Tonight, 15 minutes late, I'm sure he's hit a moose on Route 26, but maybe, maybe he survived. Someone from the hospital will call me, give me his room number. I'll bring his pajamas, some magazines. 525, still no phone call, voicemail full. I turn on the news, wait for the report. Flashes of moose blood, his car mangled as I buzz around the bedroom, dusting the furniture, sorting the sock drawer again. Did someone knock? I'm expecting the sheriff by six o'clock. Mr. Blanco, I'm afraid, he'll say. Hand me his wallet, sunglasses, wristwatch. I'll invite him in, make some coffee. 625. I'll have to call his mother, explain. Arrange to fly the body back home. Do I have enough garbage bags for his clothes? 
I should keep his ties, but his shoes? Um, order flowers, yes, roses, white or red. By 7.30, I'm taking mental notes for his eulogy, suddenly adoring all I've hated, 10 years worth of nose hairs in the sink, of lost car keys, of chewing too loudly and hogging all the bed sheets, when suddenly, Joy, our dog, yowls, ears to the sound of footsteps up the drive and darts to the doorway. I follow with a scowl. Where the hell were you? Couldn't call, right? Translation, I die each time I kill you. Thank you. That's the next poem for the second round. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Leanne Roropa is a biracial Nisi and the author of five volumes of poetry. Most recently, Tsunami versus the Fukushima 50, which was named a best book of 2019 by the New York Public Library and was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. Among her other honors is an Association of Asian American Studies Book Award and winner of the National Poetry Series. She served as the South Dakota State Poet Laureate from 2015 to 2019. Rorapa is a professor of English at the University of South Dakota, where she serves as editor-in-chief of South Dakota Review. Please welcome Leanne Rorapa. Thank you so much. Um, what a pleasure to be included in this extraordinary anthology, Chris. And thank you, Meg. Um, I'm delighted to be a part of this afternoon's reading with such tremendous poets I have so much admiration for. I'm going to be reading one longer poem from the anthology, and it's from my uh, book, Tsunami versus the Fukushima 50, which is a project that emerged in response to the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami and the subsequent Fukushima disaster and Japan. And it's a book in which I wanted to honor and commemorate Fukushima, as well as focus attention on Fukushima's ongoing legacies, uh, particularly with respect to environmental crises. Um, I was thinking a lot about um, the uh, Japanese narratives of Godzilla and the rise of the monsters on Monster Island um, in response to the dropping of the atomic bombs at the end of World War II. I was thinking a lot about uh, questions of mutation and radioactivity as employed within uh, comic books, such as the X-Men. Um, and these were sort of the lenses I, I wanted to use to think about the issues raised by the Fukushima disaster. Um, the book's composed of poems that explore the character of Tsunami as a force of nature, kind of a feral supervillainess who rises from the seismic trauma of Earth quakes in the ocean floor, much in the same way that the character of the X-Men's Magneto was forged within the trauma of the Holocaust. And uh, these tsunami poems are contrasted by a fictional cadre of first-person monologues in the voices of survivors and victims of Fukushima, loosely threaded through associations with comic book superheroes, in particular comic book uh, superheroes who... Um, had accidents involving radioactivity. Uh, so what I'm gonna read today will be one of these dramatic monologues um, in a fictional voice of a survivor. Uh, there is some violence and death uh, associated with the aftermath of the tsunami. Hulk smash. Because it was afternoon, and I was at the carnation farm when the earthquake struck. Because by the time I arrived back home to help my family, traffic jams had clogged shut the main arterial roads leading inland from Futabamachi. Because when the tsunami breached the seawall and concrete disintegrated like strewn chunks of soggy plywood, we had to leave our car and flee for higher ground. Because the elevated hill, marked as the evacuation point for an elementary school, seemed like it should be safe, 
until the tsunami rose like a thundering wall of water and blotted out the sky. Because there wasn't time for us to climb all the way up the hill, so I held my wife and daughter in my arms, and we clung together tightly, wrapped around a tree. Because the icy water uprooted the tree so easily, like plucking up a blade of grass, and tore my wife, Mayumi, away from me. Because I could see Natsu was crying for her mother, though I couldn't hear her above the roar of the water, and I was scared I'd hurt her from holding on so tight. Because when I regained consciousness again with a concussion and a broken leg after having blacked out, my arms were empty. Because she was only three. Because I was taken against my will to a hospital in Itate, where I was promised that rescue workers would search the coast for any survivors and bring them to safety. Because the meltdowns and hydrogen explosions at Fukushima Daiichi began the next day, and everyone within a 20-kilometer radius was evacuated, so that no one was able to look for my wife or my daughter. Because the nuclear accident at Fukushima Daiichi was, as it turns out, preventable. Because what if my wife and daughter were injured but still alive, and what if someone had only searched for them during those early days after the tsunami? Because it was over a month before I was allowed back, into the exclusion zone, where I found Mayumi's body in a nearby rice field. Because my wife's remains were so terribly decomposed after having been left out to weather the elements, insects, birds, and vermin, she was no longer recognizable, and the Buddhist burial rites could not be followed before her body was burned. Because over four years have passed with my life still in limbo, unable to return to what's left of my home, to my work breeding carnations, unable to lay Mayumi's ashes to rest on ancestral grounds. Because my daughter Natsu is still missing, even though I search for her every month in the five-hour increments allowed by radiation guidelines. Because I am by nature a quiet and scientific man, a botanist by trade, but I work so ferociously at clearing debris and digging along the shoreline in search of my daughter's remains, tearing off my hazmat gear when it gets in the way or when it becomes too hot, that volunteer search teams have nicknamed me the Hulk. Because so what? I no longer care about being exposed to radiation, and maybe it'll make me stronger anyway, like the weird profusion of two bright and hardy flowers blooming in the irradiated wake of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Maybe even strong enough to hold on to what matters. Because plans are underway to build a containment facility in Futaba City for the bags upon bags of contaminated topsoil and radioactive debris gathered by the cleanup workers that no one knows what to do with. Because if this happens, Futaba will become just a permanent trash site for nuclear waste, a toxic garbage dump where my daughter's remains will be abandoned forever. Because how can I let this be? Because my arms are empty. Because she was only three. Because now, every month when I spend my five hours searching the no-go zone, and I see one of the many rusted TEPCO signs reading, Nuclear Power, Bright Future of Energy, I feel such a huge surge of adrenaline and rage that I have to tear it down. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne.
Sharif Shanahan is the author of two collections of poetry, Trace Evidence, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and long listed for the National Book Award, and Into Each Room We Enter Without Knowing, a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry and the Publishing Triangles Tom Gunn Award. A recent recipient of the Whiting Award. Congratulations, Sharif. He is an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Northwestern University. Please welcome Sharif Shanahan. Thank you so much, Chris, for that introduction and also for including my poems in the anthology um, and uh, for being so generous, a community member over the years. Um, thank you. And um, thank you, Meg, for organizing this and for including me in this reading. I'm, I'm really honored to be here alongside poets I've admired for a very long time. Um, one of whom knows I admire her, the, the others, I think not so much. <laughs> um, and thank you, everybody. Um, in, in the audience for being with us today. I'm gonna read uh, two poems. While I wash my face, I ask impossible questions of myself and those who love me. Specks of toothpaste fleck the mirror. A fan spins dust in the hall. I find this is it, too vulgar, to accept. So I wait for a new starting point, as though life will begin there and then. Do you know what I mean? Not what I'm saying, what I mean. Is it possible my function is to hold all the intricate interstitial pain and articulate clarity? Tie a boat to my wrist, I sprout wings. Give me a pair of shoes, I grow fin. Once an hour, I trick myself into focus. I look into the glass as I look through it. When the new beginning comes, what then? Does life suddenly reset like an Atari? Does meaning emerge assertively and without invitation? The task is to live well enough with you, but how? How do you know what you want if you don't tell you, if you don't hear you? This poem is called Control and it was in the anthology. It is in the anthology, Control. In the Pornhub video, two houseless men suck each other on a subway bench. It's late at night, but not late enough no one is around. The people are outraged, call the men disgusting, New York and humans disgusting, while they continue to record. I have the space inside my body to feel the two men, their commitment to pleasure, absent basic comfort, the one's face nearly neutral, as though his friend's mouth and the sting of existence canceled each other out, almost like a mannequin, just there. On Hyde Street yesterday morning, walking briskly in no clear direction, I saw a man on the opposite sidewalk, a motorcycle parked at a right angle to his feet. He put one hand on a handle, the other on his crotch, and glared above the slow moving traffic at me. The question in his face, its own answer. When I tell you I don't know what to do with my life, I mean I don't know how to stay inside it. Joy, Gary says, is a feeling of profound gratitude. And before I can ask for what, for having come how far I have come, I celebrate my friend and think at once, we should be grateful then for surviving a country that makes of survival a victory and not a right. We talk about our boyfriends, Syntax, Nella Larson's passing. Gary leans across the couch to touch my chin. 
We were lovers once, briefly. I look at him, look at me. Try to love yourself, darling. He says, you're going to be here a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Sharif. That was wonderful. Um, so now uh, uh, we'll we'll take a little time to have a conversation with um, with our poets, and you can go ahead and put some questions in the chat if you have them. Um, Meg and I will um, sort of facilitate. Meg, did you want to start off with a question? Sure, that would be great. First of all, I want to start out off by saying thank you. What amazing poems you all read. And um, yeah, I felt I was really touched by all of them. And, you know, many of them I've read, read in the anthology and to hear them is just so powerful in your voices. So Chris talked a little bit about why he put this collection together and how important he felt it was. And I wondered if any of you wanted to talk about, um, you know, why now, why this collection, why you wanted to be a part of it. I know everybody expressed appreciation for being part of it, but, you know, why you feel it's important right now. Anybody want to comment on that? I guess I would add to what I, what I said at the beginning, you know, that uh, while, while certainly, you know, in the 21st century, um, queer people in the United States do have more mainstream acceptance and in many ways greater freedoms than in previous generations the backlash to that um, has been to me quite shocking and you know i wouldn't say that was the only impetus to do the anthology now but it was certainly part of it um you know uh as an as an editor as well as a poet, my the editor side of me always wants to curate. Like I'm sort of like I'm compelled to write. I'm sort of compelled to curate as well. And so this was in some ways a book I've always wanted to do. Uh, and you know, given the political climate of the recent years, I, I felt like yeah, that's those two things together make it make now the the right the right time. You know, what surprised me a little bit was, you know, when you you sent me a copy of this book, um, was how many of the poets I admire are in this book. And I never really thought about, you know, that these are queer poets, you know, except that all together in one book. And I I sort of wondered about how important that is to each or any of you that um, that influence on your poetry or for people to know your orientation or to to address it directly uh, in your poems. Well, I'm going to jump in quickly and just say that um, um, I the, I'm going to be teaching from this book and um, it's going to be very important for me as an illustration of something that I often teach, which is that these days, I think it's really important to, to write into and out of community. Um, I'm old enough to have sort of inherited a paradigm of um, being an artist that really privileged a certain kind of um, sense of the artist as sort of a solo, um, privileged, striving, romantic figure. But, over my 30 years as a writer, I really reoriented, reoriented myself as, a, as an artist that, that is in dialogue with other people like myself, whether that's because of my queer identity or being a brown person. Um, and I think that this anthology, for me at least, when I'm teaching that notion of um, 
writing into and out of community shows this dialogue, you know, manifested. Um, these poems are, you know, working as a kind of collective in this anthology. And I think that, you know, it'll be wonderful for the students to, to see that. I think we have some students listening today too, and I'd love to have them put uh, questions in the chat if they have some. But, you know, Richard, I think that's an interesting comment, Rick, about, you know, being part into and out of community and being part of community. And Richard's comment about that poem, Killing Mark, which I think you read at your wedding, didn't you, Richard? <laughs> which I think was wonderful, but, you know, that we all relate to. And it, so it's one of the things that connects us, I think, through poetry. Yeah, I and I think one of the reasons we were so uh, a bit quiet on your first um, question was exactly what Chris said. Uh, it kind of, I, I feel exactly, I think maybe we were like, we wanted to say something much smarter, but actually, I mean, what, given our times, I mean, I'm in teaching in Florida right now, right? How important this anthology is in that sense. And also, um, as, as I, you know, as the gap gets wider, right? As I realized I'm only going to get older. My students are only going to get younger, <laughs> right? Uh, like you were saying, Rick, you know, we have had other other experiences that may have taught us, and maybe we have, we have, like you said, the beautiful line uh, uh, that we heard today from Shari, it's, uh, you know, that victory, uh, I'm going to mess it up, but like, victory mm -hmm. is, is not right, right? Um, and um, yeah. we, we need to, we need to remember that that's kind of what, what it what had was happened and what is happening and i think our students don't have all the historical information and i think an anthology like this helps another kind of community build um, um i know i've gotten closer to my students because of because of the poetry that i that i that we we read together um and i and i can see that they're searching also for a community and and hate to call myself that, but elders, you know. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so I think this brings these these historical voices as well, and and as a gay community, that that's historically been one of the things that's hard for you know to keep sort of institutional memory going and history. So, I think these yeah. anthologies are important in that sense too. That's a really great comment about the institutional memory. I feel that way sometimes about women's rights, you know. <laughs> That, that younger women today don't remember what it was like when I was working in the corporate world and I was the only woman in, in the room, if you will. So there's a question here from Ohio Dominican University for all the poets. Um, it looks like several um, questions, but how do you select a poem for reading? or an anthology, and is your goal to find a poem that best represents your body of work, your ethos as a writer, or something else? Leanne, I, I, can I pick on you? You selected um, that wonderful, powerful poem today to read. How did you select that? Well, that was a poem that was included in the anthology. So, of course, I wanted sure. to um, honor and acknowledge the anthology by um, by reading um, that uh, particular particular poem. I think when I'm selecting poems for readings in general, it's... Um, <sighs> Sometimes it very much depends on the nature of the event as, you know, someone who carries intersectional identities. Sometimes I will foreground particular identities to celebrate a reading, but also sometimes it's 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 as ephemeral as um, mood or weather or kind of where I am in a certain day or sometimes poems are difficult for me to read on certain days or um, sometimes events are particularly joyous and I might pick a happier poem to read. So a lot of it's kind of um, on the fly in terms of where I am and in terms of picking readings for where I am at a given point any day. So do you decide at the last minute? Um, 
I usually decide um, earlier on in the day or um, the day before and I kind of make up my set list and sometimes I'll have an option to do a trade out if I change my mind at the very last minute. <laughs> That's great. That's great. A set I list. I like say that. something just about being in the anthology, um, being the the value of it. I, I you know, there. I I agree with everything that's been said, and it's such a strange time that we're in right now because, well, you know, especially for those of us who are older, we've lived through, um, you know, a lot of change, and it really. I am a ridiculously optimistic person, but also it just objectively looked like we were getting to a place of more and more acceptance and understanding and um, it, it, that it was going to be easier for young uh, LGBTQ people to uh, live their lives. And, you know, now we have this, this, um, you know, intense backlash and, so, of course, it seems really important because of that, but there's also something that I can't exactly put words on, but it, it this is a, a kind of a, a funny word, but it feels cozy. It feels, right. it feels good to be in this anthology with others who are very different from me in so many ways, and yet we have a commonality, and um, the I have a physical, I, I just kind of, you know, my shoulders, it's sort of like, I mean, I know this sounds really corny, but it, it feels like, like a hug. You know, I feel my body kind mm -hmm. of just coming in a little bit to, to be close. And I, I think that, um, I mean, poetry has always been a place where there's more acceptance. Um, I mean, I, I guess there are, there are poets who have extremely different politics from me, but I don't tend to run into them all that often. You know, it just seems like we we share an, an, an awful lot, even with our differences. And it feels good just to be together. I, too, love the diversity of voices in this anthology mm -hmm. and sort of the scope and the breadth of it, which just feels so um, affirming and it joyous in the sense of of being able to envision queer history and queer futurity too at the same time. And the timeliness feels very important to me because, you know, I, I teach at an institution that neatly dismantled all of its DEI centers and any random person can call the Board of Regents to report you for indoctrination. And, you know, um, it's it's important that that work be visible and present. And it's something too that I think, you know, my students need to be able to kind of see uh, their identities mirrored to them and present as opposed to um, the attempts to erase or silence. I, I really understand that, Leanne. I was uh, on a board, I am on a board that, you know, I was bringing up these issues of DEI and, and people were saying, well, you know, you, there are legal ramifications. And I really thought we were making progress in one direction. And all of a sudden it feels like we're being pulled back. There's, Chris described it as, as a backlash. And um, so I think it is important that this anthology is can be used as teaching and there is a question in the chat for the poets about how do you imagine this work being used at a high school class level? What, what can high school students learn as readers, writers, and activists from the work? And are also that there are some states where, that are very restrictive, but some actually have requirements for an inclusive curriculum. And I know many of you teach at the college level, um, but maybe you can speak to how it might be used at the high school level. Well, I've taught 
high, I taught high school for 15 years. Um, in the during the pandemic, I, I left the classroom. Um, maybe I'll go back someday, but it's been a bit of a pause, which actually that pause allowed me to do the anthology. Um, and, you know, uh, some of those years I was in Tucson, Arizona. It was very liberal. I had total control, nearly total control over the curriculum that I chose to teach. And then in rural Iowa, however, <laughs> I uh, was in for a bit of a shock. Um, it didn't take long for me to end up in the principal's office uh, for some of the things that I'd brought into the classroom that I thought were just, that th there were honestly just um, pretty tame texts. So uh, yeah, I think that, I do think that this book could get some teachers in trouble in certain, in certain settings, um, which is, you know, it's sad uh, that, but I, I think that's probably the reality for some teachers and uh, yeah, it probably varies a lot from state to state or even school district to school district. I will mention that the anthology is organized chronologically by birth year of the poet, though the birth year isn't actually published, but you know, it. so the, the poets, Frank Bedart starts, a, he's our eldest poet in the anthology. Um, and so you can, act, I think you can, you can sort of trace it's somewhat it's somewhat ephemeral but you can you can trace um a, a sort of sensibility um through the book and when you get towards the end you know the the the, the final poets in there are really young and uh you know they're I, they're I just feel like they're writing about a different world than Frank Bedart and some of the poets in the at the beginning of the book it's an interesting thing to to track that is interesting. I didn't realize that. Do you say that anywhere in here or you just put it together that I, way? I, I assembled it that way and I didn't I didn't mm. talk about that in my foreword, but um right. yeah. So if you've got the book, something to maybe Yeah. Something to keep in mind as you're as you're reading through it. I mean, a lot of us read anthologies sort of hopping around, you know, but there is a linear sort of trajectory that I think has um Maybe a flavor. There's a, the flavor changes as you move through time. I remember, you know, quite quite a lot of years back, it being really um, y young people expressing to me that it was really important to them to see someone who was living her life as a lesbian and um, doing what she wanted, you know, having a relationship, having a family having work um, that that they didn't have images of that. And I think that's mm -hmm. really changed. But I think with this incredible backlash now that it's become important again, you know, maybe in a in a different way. But I, I think it still remains important. And you know, for for young people to be able to see that to see their future to see that they can create the future, you know, as much as any of us are capable of, um, you know, that that certainly being uh, gay is not, being queer is not gonna be, um, you, you know, what stops them. There might be other factors that they have to contend with, just like we all have other factors to contend with, but um, but that this is an open road. And um, I think that that part is, it, 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 we we do that just by writing. Uh, it doesn't matter even, you know, whether the poem directly uh, addresses something, you know, my uh, mm -hmm. poem mammogram, you know, that could be any woman. It doesn't need to be a queer woman. But um, I, whatever we're doing, we we are being role models, which, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't, you know, sometimes I don't feel that different from when I did when I was young inside myself, but I, I am. And um, to, to young people, I really am. And, you know, I think that's, that's important. And I think this anthology, you know, is just an, an incredible uh, resource in that way. I think there's an element of, of courage in that too, of writing as, as writers, being vulnerable, being visible in that way, 
um, takes courage. I mean, even if they think that you said that you're owed to fat, Ellen, you know, writing about things that we don't normally talk about or don't want to talk about and making them, you know, visible and I don't know if it's acceptance or just ordinary. Um, there's a question here in the chat, um, and maybe Sharif, you want to take this. What advice would you give to a young queer writer during these times in terms of writing and publishing? Yeah, I'd be happy to speak to that. If I may, I'd like to combine my response to that um, and my response to the, the more recent uh, question or the statement really that um, this this anthology could be a primary text for a class, that queer people are right. so diverse, that we are just people, you know. I think the advice that I would offer a young queer writer would probably not be dissimilar to the advice that I would offer a young writer of any identity position, um, any embodied experience, which is to try to find what is specifically and uniquely theirs to contribute through through poetry. Um, the poet Linda Gregg, who was a teacher of mine as an undergraduate, has this really fantastic um, two-page essay called The Art of Finding that I I teach in basically every every class that I teach, which is uh, about finding, it's about many things, but in part about finding what she calls our resonant sources, the, the experiences, the people, the places that we were exposed to early in our lives that were so influential as to become constitutive. And and the that that they're actually inseparable from us that they are us and we are we are they and um, identifying those regard those sources regardless of what we then choose to write about will empower that process empower us creatively um, help us develop a sense of artistic authority or autonomy which I think is the thing we need to find. Um, yeah, I would I would agree with you, Shelby. Um, I don't see you. I don't know where you are, but I I would agree with that. You know, and um, I think some of the assumptions that can be made about identity based anthologies is that the diversity, which has been mentioned, and I think is a really important aspect, an admirable aspect of this anthology, and really, you know, all of these anthologies that are identity based to look for right. What is the difference inside the sameness? I think the assumption can can be that the differences would be about lived experiences or um, subject matter rather than aesthetic, rather than engagement with poetic craft, which would be the thing that I think answers an earlier question too about how to use this, right? Like we can use it socially, we can use it to impart lessons about, you know, the centrality of queerness, the increasing centrality or acceptance of queerness over time. But um, it's interesting to me too, always to think about what makes us distinct as poets um, on the page aesthetically, how we're engaging differently with poetic craft. Well, that's my one answer to maybe three, <laughs> three different questions. Thank you for addressing all of those questions. And sure, I, I, my pleasure. I would take one, uh, one last question and then maybe we could ask you each to to read another poem. Um, but this question that is about craft, as, as you brought up, Sharif. And Sharif, would you put in the chat the name of that essay or article and the author? That would be great. Um, but this question is, do any of you revise poems? <laughs> <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> and if so, at what point do you start reading your working poems out loud? Which I think is, you know, the first one's a yes or no, but the second one's a really intriguing question. So I'm sure you all revise poems. <laughs> Certainly. I don't believe Billy Janice. <laughs> sorry, go, so go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Someone uh, said um, Billy Collins says he never revises, and I said I don't believe him. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would just add that um, you know I think it, I try to ex I try to express this to my students because I think sometimes they have this idea that there is a draft 
and then you revise where it's really a really messy iterative process right um and i always tell them that revision should also start starts can be it should be a creative endeavor as well it's not like and so there's a very big difference between revising and editing right and revision is willing to let go of everything in the poem and and just take one line and realize this is a direction of the poem so I, I would just add that um, we all do that right definitely but just to clarify that revision isn't something that you do separately right it's constant mm -hmm. revision, right even when you're choosing you know even when you're thinking about when you're finishing that line that you're writing right now, in some ways you're already, you've already revisioned, you've tried out different words already, right? So I, I would just add that, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, revision is key. <laughs> and and at what point do you read them? Do you read a working poem, Richard, out loud? I, I think when, when I feel like I have a, uh, there's a turning point in the poem where I feel it has that X factor that there's something there that doesn't mean I'm not going to keep on working on it. Of course, it's not quite there yet. Uh, and then I will I will read it out loud, uh, not just for editing, but also to see how it feels in my body. If those words aren't sort of coming out of me um, in a way that feels natural, um, it kind of confirms some problem areas in the poem that are already kind of new with problems. Mm -hmm. and it just lives in me in a different way i mean don't get me wrong i'm not revising you know i don't read it like 80 times that's a whole other part of our craft right the performance of the poem later on but but and i will say i don't do it for every poem but or as much for every poem but i think um there's some joy in reading one's own workout right it informs us in different ways um what we're what we're really trying to get at is it's like I was the analogy of music. You know, if you're going to be writing a song, you want to hear it out. <laughs> you want to hear it eventually, right? Um, in the air, right? So, well, the end you that we, oh, what's the down? I, I, I read it to myself, you know, just in private from the very beginning because I need to hear what it sounds like. And I used to read things out loud earlier um, because even if even if the the listeners don't say anything directly, I feel like I can kind of feel in the room or feel in myself um, things that that I don't feel as much when I'm alone. You know, I can feel the places where I don't want to read the less, next line because I know it's not a good one or where mm -hmm. I feel like it's dragging and, and the poem should move faster. But... It, it, virtually and now that so much is recorded i i'm have to make different i feel like i have to make different decisions and that's one of the it, it, it's the one maybe drawback or uh downside of everything being recorded and being available forever that i don't i don't feel like i want to read poems when they're quite so disheveled as i might have been willing to try out a couple um, in the old days. I don't know, Ellen, if your wife is your first reader, but Mark is my first reader. And and he always says, you know, sometimes I don't have to, he's like, no, read it. I, you know, like read it to me first. I don't want to see it on the page. And, and like, and that's, that's another, another mm -hmm. point. Thank you for raising that. Like just how it's received, even in a small group, but even with one Yes, person. that can help a lot. My wife is my last reader. Because <laughs> she's so critical. And I, I love that. I wouldn't change it. But, you know, she is like, um, you know, te writers who are also teachers, they tend to see the potential and they can lead you toward that potential. And she's more uh, like a critic. And, you know, she sees she doesn't look at what the potential of the poem might be. She just, you know, goes, mm. Mm, no no <laughs> no and and it's 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 good you know because she won't let me you know go out as they say with spinach between my teeth you know and uh, <laughs> but, but also because I'm it's too vulnerable in the beginning to have for me to have that critical an eye be my first eye on it I can yeah. feel discouraged so I mm -hmm. wait until I feel like there's something there but you know that's the thing I mean you know many many of you are listening and many of you live with people who you love and um 
you should learn, you know, it's great, Richard, that, that you and I are here to show the ends of the continuum. You should know, you know, because your, your, your beloved can't be everything to you. And you have to, you know, don't, don't, don't put them in a position that is not going to work for you, you know, be, be <laughs> smart about it and take care of yourself because there's a lot of other people in the world that you can also work with. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the gifts I think those of you that I have taken workshops with really have as teachers is is finding those gems as buried as they might be that have that potential to really work and and helping to draw those out more than squashing the, what isn't working. Mm -hmm. Well, shall we wrap up with a, a poem from each of you? And maybe we would go in reverse alphabetical order this time. <laughs> Sharif, would you start us out? Yes, of course. This is a very short poem about uh, revision, kind of. Um, or a vision through a relationship. It's called love. Don't take yourself so seriously, he told me one morning after sex, handing back a draft of this poem. It started differently then than it does now. I am trying to decide if he was right. Mm -hmm. I think that's great that the poem answered the questions, too. <laughs> Thank you. Leanne? Uh, okay, so this is a poem about haunting, um, and it's also from the Fukushima Project. Um, and I think that hauntings are maybe a way of not forgetting or perhaps a way to acknowledge loss and grief and move toward healing. So it's kind of the intent of this poem. Ghosts of the Tohoku Coast. Of course, the ghosts are everywhere. The face that blooms confused in an unfurling peony bud. The dog who doesn't know it's dead, returning to search for the child who used to pet and play with it. The fisherman who comes to shore with early morning's neatly mended net looking for his small docked boat, taking taxi rides, wanting to go home, demanding to know, am I still alive? Oyurushi, oyurushi, whisked tea leaves whispering from the bottom of a cup, the dancing funnel cloud of dust that rises from a beaten futon, a murmuration of tiny gnats helixing up like incense from shriveled fruit at the broken altar. The jumble of unsortable bones dustpanned out to sea. The husband, the wife, the mother, the daughter, the son, the father, the sister, the brother all searching for what's been lost, driven by the electric pain of phantom limbs seizing up like dousing rods, the grief of empty cicada shells for what's been torn out, trying to fill themselves back up with the transparency of rain. How many centuries will it take for these stricken mists and fogs to be burned away? for this haunted water to evaporate, to be exercised and rinsed clean again by light. Beautiful. Thank you, Leanne. Richard. Hi. Um, so I'm going to read uh, maybe the first poem from the new book. Uh, for me... It's still a new baby. I'm not sure what it wants me to say about it, but um, it's uh, it's about that that kind of the first moment of the mind separating from the body and the birth of abstract thought in some ways. 
the splintering. As a boy, I was all body, my body part of all that was. My ears were the wind and my cheeks heard, my mouth the thunder that roared in my chest. My face in the face of rain puddles cupped in my palms, my lips the wet petals my nose kissed. And I blindly saw the stars as my eyes, blurring me that night to climb up our backyard mango tree, its trunk the will of my spine, my arms, every branch's arms, coddling the wind, its bark the thick flesh of my hands, needled with splinters when I fell into my mother's terrible cries. Ay, Dios mío. I couldn't grasp her urgency why she had to tenderly soak my hands as if I was some hurt animal she had to heal, why she spent hours pulling out every splinter with her tweezers, a surgeon operating on me in her house coat and terry cloth slippers, why her teary words, it's okay, just a few more, mijo, you could have died. Die? I knew nothing of dying. Then she kissed the last bead of blood on my finger, and said, I love you, te quiero. Meaning that what she'd love forever was more than my body, which suddenly split from me into abstract breaths in my mouth, in the mouth of my mind, for the first time saying to itself, death, joy, loss, saying, I love you too, mama. Wow, beautiful poem. Thank you. Helen. Mm. It gave me chills, Richard. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Any common desolation can be enough to make you look up at the yellowed leaves of the apple tree, the few that survived the rains and frost shot with late afternoon sun. They glow a deep orange gold against a blue so sheer, a single bird would rip it like silk. You may have to break your heart, but it isn't nothing to know even one moment alive. The sound of an oar in an oarlock or a ruminant animal tearing grass, the smell of grated ginger, the ruby neon of the liquor store sign, warm socks, you remember your mother, her precision a ceremony, as she gathered the white cotton, slipped it over your toes, drew up the heel, turned the cup. A breath can uncoil as you walk across your own muddy yard, the Big Dipper pouring night down over you, and everything you dread, all you can't bear, dissolves, and like a needle slipped into your vein, that sudden rush of the world. Oh, I love that poem, Ellen. It isn't nothing to know just one moment alive. Mm. Thank you. And Rick. So I'm going to read a very short love poem from my first book. So this poem is well over 25 years old now. And it's, yeah. called, it's called Occupations. Astronomer to the 10 Turkish moons. Count it out on your fingernails. Surveyor to the shiny silicate scar of the childhood cut on your brow. Geologist to the fault line crack your wrist has long since healed from. Treasurer to the coin of vaccination darkly minted on your left arm. Farmer to the stubbled acreage of your chin to the nocturnal root. Thank you. Mm, thank you. And thank you, Chris, for bringing us all together. Thank you all for being here. It's been just a joy for me. I, I just couldn't have thought of a better collection of poets that I admire. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to everyone for listening this afternoon and I hope you'll come back on May 29th to join us for gardening poems.